Thank you, Angelo. Uh, I will uh, try to address very briefly uh, uh, first the specificities of uh, international military intervention in relation to ordinary warfare, wars waged between various groups or countries. And secondly, uh, the particularities of uh, a moral justification of intervention which arise from these specificities of intervention uh, compared to ordinary wars. Uh, if we look at the international military interventions as we know them today, I'm talking primarily about modern international interventions. It seems that a salient feature of these interventions that sets them apart from ordinary wars is that they presume a certain superiority, even moral superiority of the interveners to those against whom or in relation to whom an intervention is launched. So unlike ordinary wars where we can simply have a conflict over interests, uh, simply a desire to prevail over something, over territory, over whatever interest we might have at stake, uh, when we launch international interventions, we assume that we act on behalf of a superior principle, usually a superior moral principle. And this point is reinforced by the fact that in most international interventions the question of military victory does not even arise because the way these interventions are organized and launched by and large guarantees military victory. Just look at the US doctrine of the uh, application of overwhelming force which is meant to minimize the casualties and de facto guarantee not only that the intervening side will prevail, but even to guarantee certain time frames within which ideally the intervening forces will be able to withdraw and leave behind a state of, of uh, uh, relative stability. So on the one hand, you have uh, an extreme disproportion between the strength of the interveners and the strength of those against whom they intervene. And on the other hand, you have this assumption of moral superiority. And you have this general rhetoric of, for example, in relation to interventions such as those uh, in Haiti or in the former Yugoslavia or in many other parts of the world, there's this rhetoric of human rights, the introduction of democracy. And often this vocabulary of the introduction of democracy is very similar to the vocabulary of installation of plumbing and electricity in buildings, you know. The idea that by outside intervention you can set up institutions and mechanisms and social practices which will lead to the development of certain values and the observance of certain standards which will be able to persist after the intervention and which will lift the moral status of the community uh, against which or in which the intervention is launched in relation to its previous state. This creates several moral specificities and moral difficulties. First, uh, uh, the demands of moral justification appear to be higher in the case of, moral, of uh, uh, military intervention than in the case of ordinary war, because uh, all these factors that we have briefly discussed uh, yesterday and today, such as uh, the absence of risk, the uh, use of technology, the uh, shift of uh, rhetoric from victory uh, to the accomplishment of mission, the increasing technicalization of the understanding of the intervention. All of this removes many issues, but gives rise to new issues. A soldier, a mobilized soldier in Bratunac or in Srebrenica in Bosnia in the early 1990s uh, was basically in a position to share the expectations, the moral expectations of their immediate community in a situation of extreme anomie, in Durkheimian terms, of the collapse of institutions, of the collapse of a legitimate order. And these people were in the position to internalize the expectations by the community as their own individual uh, moral standards. Threats to these communities arising from the eruption of civil warfare, the uncertainty about their future, the, the general uh, pressure that they were under from their communities to secure a maximum of territorial buffers to, to, to shield them against existential threats, uh, 
largely explained why many of these people were less than sensitive to general moral concerns which they might have shared with us if they were sitting in an armchair and thinking about what, what is just and what is unjust to do in, in a civil war. Many of these people were in a position to uh, take, 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 take part in, in all sorts of controversial moral, uh, morally controversial military, uh, military actions whilst feeling all along that they were acting in the only way possible under the circumstances and whilst having a strong perception of themselves as fulfilling the demands, the legitimate, attempt, uh, in those circumstances, the only legitimate demands that were imposed of, on, on them, both by their own conscience and by their immediate political community. The intervening forces, on the other hand, are typically professional. If there is a strong expectation of me as a soldier in Bratunac in the 1990s by my community, uh, uh, and if these expectations significantly narrow my freedom in making a choice whether to engage in certain actions or not, uh, such, ex such, such demands and such restrictions do not apply to, to the majority of intervening soldiers. Uh, they are not primarily bound by a sense of loyalty to the community. They are not primarily motivated by these pressures exerted by the political community. They are bound by the terms of their contract. They are professionals. They have a much greater leeway in deciding on whether to be in that place or not to be in that place than a person who is caught in the torment of war in many civil wars, many ethnic disputes, many of the situations against in which international intervention is, is called for most typically these days. So the moral demands appear to be higher when we talk about the morality of intervention than when we discuss the morality of participation in the typical conflicts uh, against which the interveners act. So, uh, if there is no controversy, if there's no, if there's virtually no uncertainty with regard to the military outcome of most interventions, then this can't really be the, the main goal of the intervention. The interventions are launched, launched on terms that basically guarantee military success. So what is the goal? The goal, at least rhetorically, at least officially, at least in terms of the official formulation of the mission, is strongly value-laden. The goal is typically based on the idea that the superior moral uh, set of moral concerns or, or a superior moral uh, uh, order is to be somehow imposed on the community against which the intervention is launched. So uh, the intervention in the former Yugoslavia, uh, the mission was basically to stop the bloodshed, to introduce democracy, and allow a peaceful transition to the normal uh, uh, functioning of civil civic relations and formal functioning of a tolerant and multicultural government. These are all value-laden goals. None of these goals are really military. The military success was perceived from the beginning as uh, uh, essentially guaranteed. So if this is so, then it appears that the moral controversies relate to at least two levels of such interventions. The first level is whether these value-laden goals are really achieved. And secondly, if they are achieved, what constitutes the legitimacy of the interveners in terms of their own moral superiority? The first question is relatively straightforward. Uh, if you look at the outcomes of the interventions, the US-led interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan, you see examples of the interventions having gone wrong and the proclaimed value goals not having been attained. In Afghanistan, uh, uh, today we have a situation where uh, uh, social stability is, is, is severely undermined and where some of the parameters of that stability can be traced statistically. For example, the production of opium uh, pasta, of, of opium uh, seed, and uh, the, the first, the first semi-product uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the chain of production of heroin is now back to pre-Taliban levels, which is, I think, 20 <laughs> times higher than during the Taliban, because the Taliban had managed to basically stifle the production of, of heroin in Afghanistan. Uh, and there are many other parameters in the situation, current situation in Afghanistan after the intervention that show that the 
general value-laden goals have really not been achieved. In Iraq, the intervention was motivated by, first by a lie that the uh, Hussein regime was in possession of weapons of mass destruction, and secondly by this idea that removing an authoritarian dictatorial regime would somehow benefit the social situation in Iraq. So today, instead of a country which was ruled in an authoritarian way but was basically a secular country, we have a country which is one of the hotbeds of Al-Qaeda activity in the world, a country where we're from uh, uh, all sorts of videos depicting the, uh, de decapitations of Western abductees are emanating. Uh, so we have a, a catastrophic development which shows a complete defeat of the mission as it is officially, as it was officially formulated. So the, these, the, uh, the, the failure of moral justification in such cases is, is relatively, relatively straightforward. Now what happens on a more complex level when the proclaimed goals in terms of values and social and political results are attained? What controversies pertain to this idea that uh, one country or one group of countries uh, are somehow entitled to intervene in another country in order to impose a morally superior state of affairs. And what establishes the moral superiority of interveners? Uh, I will suggest very briefly that uh, what establishes the moral superiority is closely linked to the sense of identity of the communities on behalf of uh, of, of which in the intervention is launched. And that in fact, this discrepancy between the collective self-perceptions of the communities which intervene and the communities against which the intervention is launched is at the core of both public support for interventions and the seeming moral concerns that give rise to, to official policy calls for intervention. Uh, one of the arguments against uh, making any moral judgments about other communities uh, uh, is based on this uh, so-called thesis of cultural relativity. Uh, it is sometimes said that cultures are so different that the moral corollaries of, of certain cultural principles and culturally accepted values uh, are not entirely transparent between cultures and it is therefore very difficult to make reliable moral judgments as to when it is justified to launch an intervention and when it is not. According to the narrative theory, uh, all these values and all these principles can be considered to be parts of life stories of the communities. Uh, and there is a strong parallel between the narratives of the communities and the individual narratives. Just like the identity of a person can be described in terms of a life story of a narrative which must satisfy certain conditions in, in order to establish a healthy and stable uh, identity in the person. Uh, so it is argued that collective narratives of communities must also satisfy the same conditions in order to be healthy narratives of functional, stable, sufficiently, manageably transparent communities. Uh, Look at the values that constitute collective self-perceptions of identity in the West and, for example, in Islamic countries. The rhetoric of human rights in the United States or Western Europe uh, is something that, is, that comes very naturally to most people. Most people will easily relate to the rhetoric of human rights. Human rights and human dignity are values that are constitutive of our own self-perceptions as political subjects in, in democratic societies. But what is the value of the rhetoric of human rights in societies such as Yemen or Qatar? And is the different position of these values in the hierarchies of values, in the value systems between those two civilizational contexts something that is morally relevant? Is it more morally consistent and morally justified to consider human rights as important as we do in the West than to consider them to be relatively peripheral, as is the case in countries such as Yemen or Qatar, where basically sovereigns are considered to be simply actors who act on behalf of God, God's emissaries on earth, where 
uh, legal regulations such as Sharia law are considered to be natural sort of, sort of outcomes of, of certain perceptions of natural law. Uh, what entitles us to believe that in situations where there are gross violations of what we describe as human rights in Qatar or, Ye or Yemen, uh, uh, what entitles us to believe that we should launch a military intervention to protect those who are part of a cultural system within which the rights that are, we hold so dear uh, simply do not play an important role. What about introducing democracy in such cases? Are we truly capable of comprehending the collective values of societies that are so different as these two societies are different from the Western systems of values? How about the Taliban practices against, uh, against adultery? Is it less important for uh, an Islam, uh, Islamic society run by the Taliban uh, to protect the young people from influences which we consider relatively normal in our Western civilization, such as a, relative, a relatively high level of sexual liberties, the social acceptability of divorce, the social acceptability of abortion, uh, uh, and all sorts of things that we consider to be uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, the, the legacy of, of, of a liberal society. Is it more important, uh, is it less important for them to be shielded from these values which deeply threaten their collective sense of identity uh, than it is for us to be able to, to, to impose such values because it is our intuitive perception that, that human rights are being being trampled in ways that require external intervention. It seems to me that uh, what is described, what is too often described as cultural relativity is something that really represents a genuine epistemological boundary between various value systems. And this epistemological boundary has moral consequences. Look at the recent examples. We have recently had a situation which has led in some, in some or has precipitated in some, in some ways the current tensions between Russia and, and the West. Uh, a situation which, from the point of view of the current fighting in the Ukraine and, and the current escalation of, 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 uh, of uh, hostilities, seems trivial. How many of you remember the incidents with Pussy Riot? Uh, a group of young women uh, who, a couple of years ago, staged a highly offensive performance in the main Orthodox Church in Moscow. Uh, a performance which most of the people there considered to be extremely blasphemous, leading to their arrest and coupled with some other uh, 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 facets of, of their activity at that time eventually led to their imprisonment, uh, was perceived in the West as a major, major violation of human rights. It was lifted on the level of verbal confrontation between the American and the Russian presidents. Now, does the West really understand what dancing naked in the altar of an Orthodox church meant for the Russians? Does Barack Obama, is Barack Obama capable of understanding what it means for believing Russians to see women who in the Orthodox religion are banned from entering the altar, stripping naked and dancing around the altar and within the altar. Has this been sufficiently explained prior to the escalation taking place? And these are countries that are not that far apart in their values. These are countries that, uh, that, that, that are constantly in interaction. These are countries that share many social practices. This is not a difference like that between Qatar and Yemen on the one side and, and, and Britain on the other. So we shouldn't under, underestimate the epistemological barriers that exist uh, between our perceptions of what, what, what it means for the other community to have uh, a stable identity and to not feel threatened and to, to sense a certain degree of security which allows them to, to behave what, in ways that we, we would describe as normal and what really threatens them sufficiently to trigger uh, 
repressive actions such as against Pussy Riot or even, even confrontations such as those with the regime in, in Kiev. So if, if we look at the general structure of these values and these principles, which we often don't understand in each other or, or, or don't, don't understand sufficiently, then there's this general principle in uh, the theory of identity uh, in the narrative theory of identity that the, the simpler the narrative is, the simpler the life story is, the more consistent it is structurally, the healthier it is. A community, to, make, to, to, to clarify this a little bit, a community where there's a high degree of consensus about its past, its present, and its plans for the future, about its problems, conflicts, its neighbors, and all the issues that constitute its uh, uh, worldview, where there's a high degree of consensus, this, the narrative of this community could be described as a relatively simple straight line. It can be curved a little bit. It cannot be ideally straight. But the ideally healthy narrative is often described simply graphically as a straight, as a straight line. Maria Schechtman wrote famously about the, the role of narrative in the mental health of individuals and collectives. And she, uh, 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 she proposes very interestingly that there are two conditions that a narrative must satisfy in order to be healthy. The so-called articulation condition and the so-called reality condition. The articulation condition means that the narrative must be sufficiently elaborate and sufficiently intelligible to allow effective communication with the others. In order for me to consider you mentally healthy, at the very minimum, the necessary condition for this is for me to be able to at least broadly relate to what you are saying to me, to broadly be able to understand facts and interpretations of facts about your life that you're offering me. The second condition that Schechtman proposes is the reality condition. It means that the narrative of a person or a collective must uh, uh, take sufficient account of the salient facts of the reality that we share. We must be able to understand that we live in the same reality in order to consider each other sane. And these criteria are very directly applied in psychiatry, for example. Psychosis is described as a detachment from reality, failure to satisfy the reality condition. It is often described as an inability to articulate one's own identity, fuzzy identities. Richard Kennisberg, for example, writes about uh, uh, extending these parallels further, parallels between individual mental health and collective mental health, by claiming that our conservative definitions of psychosis and mental illness, which uh, are limited to individuals, should be used more liberally. And he asks a question about the possibility of there being psychotic communities. Can we consider some communities to be psychotic, to be collectively mad, crazy? And his example is the Nazi society during World War II. The narrative of most of the uh, convinced Nazis during World War II was that the German race was under threat from the Jews because the Jews were allegedly so numerous, so wealthy, so powerful, and so well connected that eventually they would undermine the prosperity of the German nation. Now, Kennigsberg goes into uh, very detailed statistical analysis to show that the Jews in Germany and around Germany were neither as numerous nor as wealthy and certainly not as malignant and well connected to, rep to present any threat to the German nation. So his question was, given that these people, the Nazis, many of them were intelligent people, they weren't idiots, was there a collective psychosis which was, in, is it, which was induced in the collective, in the entire political elite, to, to, to say the very least, and, and in, into certain parts of the society to, to be more, more liberal in our formulation. So can collectives be crazy? The official line today is that they can't. Just as the official line in international criminal law is that there is no criminal guilt of nations. Only persons can be criminally guilty. But what is the explanatory value of this limitation? And what would be benefit from potentially extending this labeling to allow us to label communities as being psychotic? If I'm healthy, as far as my narrative does not get terribly warped up 
twisted up and knotted up so that it no longer satisfy, not, satisfies neither the condition of articulation nor the condition of reality, then why isn't a political community which is so warped up in its narrative, so conflicted from the inside, which has so many diff diff different accounts of its own identity, of its own history, of its own plans for the future, of its own prospects for the future, why is that community not crazy? Why is it not mad? This would be an easy explanation. We would simply be able to say that the Afghan society is a mad society because its narrative is so warped up, so, uh, so, so difficult for us to understand that we feel a moral obligation to intervene, to set things right. That the Iraqi society was so authoritarian that none of the concepts that we are used to operating with simply don't work there. But look at the structure of the narrative within those societies. Look at the structure of the narrative of the American society today and the societies of the intervening coalitions compared to the structure of the Afghan society run by the mullahs just before 9-11. The same mullahs who rejected the US ultimatum to deliver Osama bin Laden and the Taliban, which was pretext for the bombing and the intervention after 9-11. What was their narrative like? Was it twisted up? Was it complex? Was it insane? Was there much dissensus? Structurally, is the narrative of a Yemeni society less healthy than the narrative of a Canadian society, of a multicultural flourishing society with all sorts of conflicting views, with all sorts of different views on the past and the present and the future? with all sorts of political debates. Structurally speaking, in a way medically speaking, the intervening communities tend to have more complex narratives, more difficult narratives, less healthy narratives than many of the communities against which interventions are launched. Now, if this is so, and most people would probably agree, that there is more complexity in self-perceptions in the West than, for example, in the Islamic world, what constitutes the superiority of these narratives, of these identities, of these values that legitimate international interventions? I'm talking about a moral legitimation, not about a legitimation based on projections of interest and the structure of international relations and the institutional mediation of these relations. Uh, if Structurally speaking, we would be justified to say that many of the intervening societies are less mentally healthy than many of the societies against which interventions are launched. What justifies us in uh, assuming any, any normative framework of, of moral justification for any intervention whatsoever? And practically speaking, if we want to be able to be very concrete and to say that this intervention is justified and that intervention is unjustified. If we are not Kantians on some interpretations, as, as Jovan, Jovan keeps, keeps saying, we had this discussion before the conference, if we don't assume general uh, normative positions such as uh, on one interpretation, a Kantian interpretation might be that no intervention based on uh, this idea of moral improvement is ever justified because of the moral autonomy of the of the sovereign ability of everyone, sovereign province of everyone, everyone to, to freely decide on their own moral improvement. If we want to be practical, and if we need a theory that will allow us moral judgments based on a case-by-case case, uh, approach, then it seems to me that the narrative theory is an excellent candidate for such, for such an approach. It can fit very well within the existing institutional system. If you adopt a narrative theory of values, you can judge which country is legitimate in intervening against which country by using the existing institutional system. You can entrust these judgments to various bodies of experts. You can, you can entrust uh, uh, decision-making to international organizations which exist. You can uh, reconcile such normative uh, processes with the international law. Uh, and you can realistically say and argue that 
intervening against the former Yugoslavia or in the former Yugoslavia in the middle of the bloodshed in Bosnia was, for example, justified, whereas the intervention against Iraq, which has led to catastrophic results, was unjustified. You can disagree on this without questioning the basic premises of the narrative theory. And I think this is the methodological value of the moral, uh, of, the, of, of the narrative theory of, of moral justification of interventions. Now, uh, moral qualifications obviously are not always based on general moral reasoning. Look at the use of the term terrorism today. You know, terror, the original meaning of terror, I think, I think in, in Edmund Burke was, 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 was intended to, 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 to denote uh, uh, acts of repression by the state against the citizenry, so state terror. And we later had this etymological development into terrorism where various institutionally mediated definitions moved the concept, the meaning of the concept from the original terror to this idea that terrorism is somehow primarily the activity of informal groups against the majority of the citizens and the legitimate institutions of the state, which is not what it was originally. So, you know, moral labels don't always have much to do with genuine moral reasoning, such as the term of terrorism and, you know, murder in, in, in international relations and in security studies do not always correspond to uh, sustainable moral, moral arguments. So we need a theory which will be able to allow us the possibility to judge, to be methodologically consistent and to accommodate these differences to argue about the consistency of the arguments without a priori and universally forcing us to either accept or reject this or that international intervention. We need a theory that is going to be able to accommodate all these uh, special features of interventions as opposed to ordinary wars, uh, which will really allow us to say that we can still reserve the right to intervene in certain countries while, for example, generally adopting the position that interventions are to be avoided whenever possible. We will be in the position which will allow us to be sufficiently flexible to intervene when we have to intervene, and yet to avoid this, this sliding down to this position where the US is currently sliding towards, and that is a position that whatever you can attain by sufficiently universally politically acceptable violent means is something that you should seriously consider as your political and even social objective. So uh, my, conclusion, my conclusion is modest. It is not that everything that the narrative theory of intervention says is irrefutably true. It is rather that the methodology that the narrative theory offers us is perhaps the most useful one uh, uh, for the purpose of reconciling the traditional philosophical and moral concerns about intervention and the existing institutional system and the existing realities within which uh, 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 the urgency of interventions is, is often felt, uh, at least in those countries that, that are capable of intervening. Thank you.